today, to wrap up the event, we're gonna talk about the three levers, or the three, really the foundational engines uh, for building a SaaS business, to make sure that it keeps growing well beyond any goal you might have, and most importantly, doesn't stall out and plateau. So here's where you can find me on the Twitters, if you guys want to, hit me up with questions later. But here's who I am. This is what I've been doing the last couple years. I currently run the growth team at I Will Teach You To Be Rich, built the growth team over at Kiss Metrics, and that's how I learned a lot of these, these frameworks. So the three foundational growth levers. When I'm trying to build a SaaS business, this is what I obsess about. More than anything else, it's not tactics, it's not landing pages, it's not necessarily even A-B tests. I start here. The three levers are world-class churn, revenue expansion from your cohorts, and accelerating acquisition at the right time. The timing is actually really critical, and we'll get into this at the end. So here's what you need to know. If you don't get these three things working together, you will plateau. It might be a 30K MRR, might be a 50K, might be 100, might even be 500K in MRR. But if you don't get this thing running smoothly, you will plateau, it's just a matter of time. Not if, but when. Also, you got to get these things working in the right order. You have to tackle them in the right order. If you do this out of sequence, you're basically trying to grow a SaaS business that has some deep fundamental problems, and again, then you'll plateau. So first, let's talk about churn. This is number one. Now I know Patrick gave some benchmarks. Um, to be honest, I don't know who's saying 5% monthly churn is a good benchmark. I think that's a horrible churn rate. Uh, but here's the, uh, the baselines or the benchmarks that I use, okay? Your target should be 2 to 3% monthly churn, if not more than that, okay? Three is a little on the high side. If you're in that 3 to 5% range monthly churn, honestly, you don't have product market fit yet. Your product isn't good enough. You need to double down and keep working. If you're in the 5 to 10% range, especially if you're early on, that might not seem like a lot, but your business is basically on fire, okay? You have a major product market fit gap. You're not delivering anywhere near the value that you think you are, and you need to focus really heavily on closing that gap in your product market fit. If it's over 10%, then you should probably get out of the subscription game because it's not going to work. Now let's say your churn isn't where it needs to be. You'll get your team in the room, and you guys will start brainstorming a bunch of ideas on how to fix that problem. Here's the ideas that come up very frequently. You know, let's go ahead and remove the self-service cancellation so people have to call us to cancel. Uh, why don't we try to fix product onboarding? Why don't we push annual plans? Why don't we force annual plans? We could reach out to inactive accounts and re-engage them before they finally churn out. We could do downsell campaigns. We could prioritize support for our largest customers, so only the small customers cancel. Or if we have you know, a large enough price point, we can build a really robust customer success team with onboarding programs and 30, 60, 90 day goals and a lot of structure to really make sure people get integrated and set up. So there's a lot of options. Only a couple of them are good ones. So here's how I break them out. Bad versus marginal versus major. The major wins are the ones you want to focus on. Marginal, they'll help, but they'll help at the margins. Okay, these are small tactical things you can do. They're not going to cut your churn in half. And the bad ones you really want to stay away from. Now, the removing self-service cancellation, it's a bad option. However, it really works, especially if you, uh, if you have poor product market fit. And um, if you rip your self-service cancellation out, your cancellation will go down, okay? Now, the reason I say it's a really bad idea is because you're causing some really serious damage to the long-term of your business, and it's not gonna show up in the metrics right away. You're hitting your brand, you're really pissing your current customers off, and even worse, the biggest problem is your team is no longer focused on the core problem, which is fixing product market fit and the product. They're worried about tactical hacks that get you through the next couple of months or through the next year. That's not where you want your team to spend their time. The other bad option, contacting inactive accounts. Don't do this. 
All you're gonna do is remind people that they don't get any value out of your product and then they're gonna cancel. Your churn is going to double while you're running that campaign. You're gonna do it for a few months. You're gonna realize that's a really bad idea. You're gonna stop doing it and then your churn's gonna come back down. So just skip all that and don't do it in the first place. The marginal ones, pushing annual plans. Yes, you should push annual plans. It helps with cash flow. Um, it does reduce churn slightly, but it's not a game changer. Support ticket prioritization, yes, your biggest customers should get immediate response if possible, but doesn't cut your churn in half. Same thing with downsell campaigns. Less revenue is better than no revenue, but once someone wants to downsell, it, they're already on the way out. So the major wins, they're generally on onboarding or the product. So improving the value of the product or helping people get to that value as quickly as possible. These are hard problems. They're not easy. Your team's gonna struggle with them, but it's really your own, only lever to permanently get churned down, right? So don't avoid the hard problem and get distracted by little tactical hacks. Now if you noticed, I skipped one item, the forced annual. There are certain situations where forced annual can work really well, and sh you should do forced annual. The biggest, most straightforward one is if there's an established norm in your category at the segment of the, the, the whole target market that you're going after. You know, small business versus mid-market versus enterprise. There are established norms at every level for any given category. If there's a norm, do forced annual. So, a very easy example is marketing automation, especially mid-market. Pardot, HubSpot, Marketo, all annual contracts. If you're in mid-market at all, you can usually get away with forced annual without any issues. However, be really careful with this stuff because if you misjudge it and you force annual plans, you could drop your funnel off a cliff. Uh, your acquisition before and after you try forcing annual uh, will literally just drop. Uh, down to 10, 20% of what it was last week. Be very, very careful with trying to force people when there isn't an established norm in your space, in your category. But really, again, don't get sucked into the tactical hacks when it comes to churn. Focus on product market fit, focus on onboarding, those are your two levers. Now, churn isn't the only way to measure product market fit. There's another way I like to validate that churn and the product value, or the churn is a result of product value. And the way I like to do that is with this thing called the product market fit question. I'm sure some of you have seen it. Son Ellis came up with this. Heaton taught it to me. Uh, and I now use this on just about any SaaS product I touch. I start here to get a sense for what is the gap on my product market fit, regardless of what churn might be saying. Right? I need another data point because I'm about to invest a lot of time and energy in a potential problem. I want to make sure I'm going in the right direction. So the question is pretty straightforward. It's a multiple choice question. You ask, how would you feel if you could no longer use whatever your product is? Three choice, multiple choice, very disappointed, somewhat disappointed, or not disappointed. It's not really that useful. Pretty simple. Send this to a couple hundred of your paying customers, and you'll, you'll know instantly what your product market fit actually looks like. Because there's a very simple benchmark that you should be targeting. When you ask this question, 40% of the respondents should say very disappointed. In other words, at least 40% of people love your product. Usually when I run this survey, I get a 25 to a 35% um, uh, product market fit score, is generally what we call it. The products, the value that you think you're delivering with your product is generally not quite as good as it really is, okay? Your customers have a higher standard than you do. This question tells you whether or not you're really meeting that benchmark. And two, two other products that I've done this survey on that I can actually talk about, um, actually Heaton ran this survey on Slack, and they had a product market fit score of 51%. When I was at Kissmetrics, I did a survey on Google Analytics users they were at 72%, which is ridiculous. It's by far the highest score I've ever seen. Uh, I guess people really love their vanity metrics. 
uh, but you're not going to hit these numbers, right? If you get above 40, great. Your product's where it needs to be. Your churn's probably at a very manageable level. You can focus on those marginal tweaks to continue to optimize it, but you can move forward into the next levers, into the next engines of your business. If you're not here, do not pass go, do not keep going, focus on your product. So second big engine, cohort expansion. A lot of people miss this step, and it really hurts them later. Fundamentally, you want your product built in a way and priced in a way that as your customers grow, you grow too. Right? As they add more people, as they add more revenue, you are also generating more revenue from that customer. Now the trick to making this work really comes down to one variable. And Patrick got into this a little bit yesterday, but it's really the quality of your pricing metric. Do you have a really high caliber pricing metric baked into your product, baked into your business model? Now the easiest, almost cliche example of this at this point is Salesforce and their user or seat metric. Right? So every time you add a user to Salesforce, you pay them more money. Now this works almost a little too well at Salesforce because of how connected that pricing metric is to value. So every time I add a sales rep, I'm about to spend a lot of money on that person's salary and I'm about to make a lot more money than that salary. A couple hundred dollars a month on that extra user seat is irrelevant, right? I don't care. No director of sales, no VP of sales, no sales manager ever has to get approval for adding another license to Salesforce because the value is that easy to see. Most companies are not like that. Most companies try to force a pricing metric around seats or some other metric that either isn't understandable or is too complicated or isn't tied closely enough to revenue. And go to webinar is actually a good example where they get half of it right and they screw up the other half. I think if they just tweak their pricing, they could have, they'd add some very nice growth to their business. So they actually have two pricing metrics. The first one works really well. It's on attendees. They have three tiers based on how many attendees you want to be able to invite into your webinar. This works great and I never have any issues getting approval for budgets on GoToWebinar or upgrading GoToWebinar. And the larger my marketing machine gets, the more I'm gonna to have to pay GoToWebinar. It's everything that we want from a really great pricing metric. The more attendees I have, the more demos I'm throwing people into, the more trials I'm getting, the more sales I'm making, right? The connection is there. However, their second pricing metric is really poor. It's organizers, it's admins that help you run the webinar. That connection to webinar, or that connection to revenue, is actually really weak, right? If I have another admin help me run a webinar, that's not gonna actually do anything for my revenue. It's not gonna help me get more leads, not gonna help me get more demos. All it's gonna do is take some slight annoyances out of my day, out of my job, right? But do I really wanna burn my own social capital internally as a manager of an entire team to get approval for an upgrade on GoToWebinar? No, I'm just gonna get pissed off at GoToWebinar and we're all gonna use the same login, right? So don't force the seats metric. Find a pricing metric that really works with the value that you're delivering so people wanna upgrade and it's really easy for them to do so. So again, tie it to value, as close to value as you possibly can. For a lot of your products, this might not even be obvious. Right, you know, like Lars, actually, well, what, where's my value metric here? How can I actually tie a given event to revenue or similar, or you know, on a, the amount of dollars I'm saving a particular customer? Even if it's complicated, spend some serious time with your team figuring this out. Because if you get this right, you'll basically add um, potentially millions of you know, monthly recurring revenue without having to do any extra work. So it's worth the time up front. The real magic from this engine comes when you pair it with the first engine, getting that super low churn. If you get your churn rate down and you get your expansion revenue up, you end up in this very magical place called negative churn, right? Now negative churn, it's, all it means is that the revenue from each cohort, each group of customers that you're pulling in, 
expands faster than the revenue that you're losing from that cohort, from cancellations and downsells. Now let's do a quick recap so we know where we are in our business at this point. Okay, we spent a lot of time focusing on product market fit and our product value, so we've gotten our churn way down. We've then spent a lot of time focused on our pricing metric to get our expansion revenue up. We've now combined the two, so we're in negative churn, and our business is now stable or growing without any acquisition. We don't have to do anything at the top of the funnel. We don't need a growth team. We don't need an online marketing team. We don't need to worry about brand, nothing. This, re like this, this business model is incredibly stable. Right? This SaaS business is, is basically sitting there waiting to grow. Your entire team could take an entire month off, not do anything, and you'll still grow. Right? That's absolutely amazing. And the best SaaS companies get to this or get very, very close. Now let's talk about acquisition. The last kind of red flag that I look for before like really trying to build a lead gen program or a growth program is if you really have solid product market fit, there should be some word of mouth growth in your funnel, right? There should be some steady, consistent, it'll be small, won't be aggressive, won't be crazy, but you should be able to feel the word of mouth in your funnel. As soon as you launch any sort of online marketing programs or acquisition programs, you know, that just blends into everything else and you can't see the word of mouth, you can't feel it. But if you're not doing any of that stuff already, it should be obvious that that's happening. When you talk to customers and ask them, hey, how did you hear about us? The fact that they heard about themselves, heard about you from a friend, a coworker, a boss, some other company, some blog post, those kind of answers should come up very frequently. If that's happening, okay, now you're really ready to focus on acquisition. So there's a lot of lead gen paths out there. Most of these can be bolted on top of any B2B SaaS business. Uh, everything from you know, inbound and content engines, cold calling, events, partnerships, uh, you can get into paid, PR, affiliates, viral loops, if you really bake them into the product. Uh, you go after social, I've seen all of these work. In most categories, they all can work. But the thing is, you really need to focus. Okay, there, I've, I've done all of these at one point or the other. Some of them I'm very good at, some of them I'm okay at. But every time I'm thinking about, okay, how am I gonna find the next source of growth? How am I really gonna grow like an, uh, a consistent, stable acquisition engine? I'm always thinking about how can I focus? How can I go after one channel, do that really well? And then as soon as I think I'm hitting diminishing returns on that channel, how can I go after the next one? Do not spread your team too thin. Do not spread yourself too thin. You'll never build the momentum that you really need. Generally, it takes me a solid, a solid year to build a channel from scratch, okay? There's a steep learning curve on these things. Generally, every channel, there's a certain pattern that you need to get to sync up just right. There's a couple of variables that all need to line up, and then the channel works. But if any of those is out of sync, then the whole thing fails. Right? Either you're generating traffic, but you're not generating revenue, or vice versa, or you're not sure how to scale it, you don't know how to throw a system behind it um, that can be run by kind of an entry-level marketer to keep it growing consistently. There's a lot of complexity that goes into being able to pull that off, and every channel is different, and there's usually different quirks when you go from one category or one target market to the other. So don't spread yourself too thin. A good benchmark for what you're looking for 10% month over month lead growth. That's usually where I start. Uh, depending on the size and how much you know, growth is built into the engine already, you can tune that up or down. But generally you're looking for something in this range. The real question though is why not start this in the beginning? Why not do this earlier? And more importantly, what happens if we do do it at the beginning? Well, some nasty things start to happen. The biggest point is that acquisition cannot outrun high churn forever, especially if you're missing that expansion engine to cover a big portion of that churn. And the reason for this is acquisition tends to scale and grow in a stepwise function. It's linear. Right, so I get a spurt of growth, it tapers off, then I go find another spurt of growth, it tapers off, and I just kind of work my way up a staircase. Very few channels are truly exponential on the acquisition side. 
Every once in a while you find one, but they're very, very rare. And if you're not sure whether or not yours is, then it's definitely not, okay? However, on the other side, churn does scale exponentially. No matter how good you are at acquisition, if your churn is high, it's gonna catch up, and then you plateau. So you wanna make sure everything's built in up front to avoid that in the beginning. Now, if you're really good at acquisition, you could push that problem down the road, and you could keep you know, finding other sources of acquisition, you can keep optimizing, but sooner or later, it catches up with you, and things get really hard. So ask yourself, if the majority of your acquisition every month goes to replacing lost MRR, you're in a bad spot. And it's a matter of time before you plateau. Now, poor product market fit doesn't just show up in churn. It also shows up in the funnel. People think that all these metrics and all these different um, you know, pieces of a business operate independently, that you can push on one without impacting the others, and it's definitely not true. Deep problems with your product will hit your funnel. And you'll end up with something, if the product market fit is bad enough, you'll end up with something I call the alligator sales funnel. Now, if you have good marketers, they know how to run online channels, they'll find a way to grow the top of the funnel. You will get more traffic, you will get more free trials, you will get more demos. They will find a way to do that even at an aggressive growth rate at 10% month over month. So the top of your funnel gets this nice growth curve. However, because you have product market fit problems, not only are you having a bunch of customers churn out the back end, but you're having really serious problems taking that top of the funnel and converting them into actual customers and into actual revenue. So the top of the funnel lifts, the middle of the funnel doesn't budge an inch. Now the reason this happens is because marketing can dodge a bad product, and fairly easily too. A halfway competent marketing team will be able to just avoid it entirely. They'll get a little bit more vague with their benefits and their value props. They'll replace screenshots with illustrations, okay? They'll just skip all the little details of the product and neglect to talk about it, because they know as soon as they actually start talking about it, all the conversion rates go down. Okay, so they can lift the conversion rates but your sales team or your product onboarding, if you're self-service, they don't have that same luxury, okay? They have to actually show the customer what they're getting at some point. Now, if you have a world-class sales team that really knows how to close, you might be able to delay this problem, uh, but you're still gonna have issues with churn. And anything short of the absolute top-tier world-class sales team is gonna struggle with this. Any average, um, typical sales team is not gonna have a good time. Now the alligator funnel, it actually gets even worse because not only do you have this really serious problem in the middle of the funnel where your acquisition just is going to shit, but your entire team starts focusing on the symptoms and not the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is your product market fit is not where it needs to be. You're not delivering the value that you really need to be to those customers or to your prospects. But marketing will start blaming the sales team and the sales team will start blaming the marketing team. Sales will say that marketing can't, uh, or is only generating shit leads. Sales, or marketing team will say that sales doesn't know how to close worth a damn. Uh, and the entire culture gets really negative really fast. And what's worse is now your entire team is focused on a problem that really isn't the actual problem. And it's causing a lot of negativity, people are getting burnt out, um, and you're losing a lot of internal momentum. When you see things like this, it's usually a product problem. It's a churn problem. You really got to attack the fundamentals of the business. Your marketing and sales teams aren't going to solve that for you, right? It's a leadership issue. It's a product issue. Go solve the hard problems. If you do this up front by focusing churn early, then when you do throw gas on the fire, and built out a sales org and a marketing org and a demand gen program and this entire inside sales funnel, you don't have these fundamental problems that forces you to re-engineer that entire thing in mid-flight. So again, the three growth levers and the order that you go after them. First, make sure you have product market fit and super low churn. Don't go past that until you've hit it. Then get your cohort expansion in place 
Really focus on that pricing metric. Okay, that's the key. Then, and only then, do you go build your lead gen program on top of all that. Thank you. I'm now happy to do as many questions as you guys want. Hey, so uh, you mentioned if you're sitting at over 10% churn, you should basically just shut down what you're doing because it's not working. Well, I am that guy. Um, okay. <laughs> I am sitting at well like over 10%, 12%, 13% at this point. Mm -hmm. I'm hitting every one of the plateaus that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. How serious are you about that statement? Is that an offhand remark, or should I seriously be reevaluating what I'm doing or my product market fit, or what? Yeah, so if I was in your position, I would be asking some very serious questions on whether or not I'm going after the right category, right? So not just how can I tweak my product, but am I serving the right customer? Like, should I go after an entirely different target market? Um, like, are you looking at a very extensive pivot? And the answer might be yes, but I, I can't tell you that. You're gonna have to spend a lot of time with your customers and do some soul searching on, is there an opportunity here? Or should I just go after something else? Um, a couple of, couple of things to look for to know that whether or not you're on the right track. One is if your product is project-based, in other words, people come in, they do one project off of it, and then they go, they stop working with it, uh, you're probably gonna have some pretty high churn, right? Survey tools are a really good example of this. You come in, you run your survey, you, you stop running your survey because it's done, it's one campaign, and then you cancel your account. Right, SurveyMonkey actually looks, they don't even look at monthly churn. They track all their monthly customers on an annual basis because the churn is so bad because uh, people are constantly coming in and back out. Uh, so I'm always looking for a SaaS product that is going to be used very consistently by my target customer. I'm also looking at something, you want to find a product that when you ask your customers, like when you're not even talking about your product, and you're just asking them you know, about their day-to-day, -day, and you say, okay, what are like the top three problems you deal with? If your product does not help solve one of those top three problems, it's probably a bad sign. Right? It's gonna be really hard to convince them that yes, there's value here, and you really wanna keep paying for it. Hey Lars, I have a question about the churn numbers you threw out. So yeah. you have you know, 10% and above. Um, typically what I've seen is with SaaS, the first, say, 60 days, is gonna be higher churn and then it's gonna drop way off, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So when you say you're 5%, you're 3%, are you talking yeah. post 60 days? Sometimes that can be 90, depends on the app. Mm -hmm. Are you talking the post 60 day mark? Because if you just average up over all the, the months, you're gonna get a higher than unusually higher rate because a lot of people in the first 60 yep. days are actually just extending their trial. Yeah, yeah, so that first 60 days, there is a lot more volatility in it. Um, I think Shopify stopped tracking, or they actually separated their churn rates out from 60 days versus everything after that, and tracked them completely separately. So take a look at it. Um, if you see remarkably different churn, you know, at the 60 days, and it's just people that didn't onboard, um, then yes, there's probably you know some wins there. If that's happening to you, I take a really hard look at your onboarding and say, great, the value's here. The people that do see the value stick around. How can I close that gap? So even if the churn is higher in the first 60 days, I'm not getting hit nearly as hard from it. Um, do you have any general advice on when it makes sense to have a free trial versus a freemium model for, for the onboarding? So freemium and free trial are two entirely different funnels. <laughs> I used to be really hard on B2B freemium until uh, Mixpanel kicked my ass with it. <laughs> and now I take it a lot more seriously. So freemium can really work tremendously well. Uh, but there's a couple of things that are required in order to make that happen. Especially on SaaS, you need some halfway decent pockets um, for cash because the support is gonna get hard. Um, and that's it's probably one of the reasons we didn't do it. Or I, we should have done it anyway. But it'll seriously up ramp, support time. Um, your, you, need, you need to make sure that your target market is big enough for freemium, because your conversion rates are gonna be really bad. And that's okay, that's sort of part of the game. Um, but if, you, if, you, you know, if you're looking at your entirely or entire addressable target market, 
there's like 10,000 potential people, that's, it's never gonna work, right? Don't even bother trying it. Try to, try to raise your rates, go for uh, some pretty high price points, high touch model. Don't do this like freemium, low touch uh, model. But if you're, if you're going after a category that's really, really large, uh, then it can work pretty well. Uh, again, the other, other area that really starts to make sense is any type of product that, again, is not like project-based, right? It's ongoing usage, because then you get them in, you get them using it regularly, and then you upsell them later, which also depends, again, on the quality of that pricing metric. So if you have any problems with your pricing tiers or getting people to upgrade, that'll also show up in really low conversion rates on freemium. So it can work, it's acquisition, but again, like everything else, there's a lot of nuance to it. There's another question over here. Hi, Lars. I'm over here on the le your left. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, we have a meal plan subscription business. So you, we have had dinner before, and I know I will teach you, Peter. You guys have some kind of a subscription meal plan business or something, I, yeah. I think. Because I actually hired a developer that actually subscribes to it. And I'm kind of curious, and I know maybe I, you're not going to be able to tell me like what the churn rates are, but our, our monthly churn is 23.1% on monthly, but our annual churn is like 1.2%. So I'm just curious what, what you have to say about that. You know, We're pretty well established, about four plus years down the road. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, so every once in a while, you know, there, there's, like as I mentioned earlier, there's a couple situations where forced annual can work, you know, if there's established norms in this space. It can also work in, like, either you're going after very small businesses or B2C, and your ch monthly churn rates are just extraordinarily high, that 20, 30% range. If you push, and if you actually force annual, like you're already seeing, you know, 1% on your annual plans, I might try forced annual for a month and see, you're gonna take a hit on acquisition, but if it's that bad, uh, you can get people bought in, and it, you're more, it's about getting the commitment for the long term, especially since you know, really small businesses or B2C, customers are really fickle. They don't tend to stick around. Okay, yeah, then I would consider forcing annual and not offering the monthly plans um, at all. Uh, just wondering if you can share any quick wins with regards to onboarding from your time at Kissmetrics. Yeah, so every on the my answer to that is there are no there are no quick wins on onboarding. So every onboarding funnel is different. I've done every time I find a couple of wins that I think I that that work consistently, they're only working consistently in that funnel. As soon as I go try them on a different B two B funnel, um, they don't work nearly as well. They're probably the one that I use very regularly is the number of sign-up fields. I know it's kind of like a very standard best practice, reduce sign-up fields uh, to increase conversions. In a lot of forms, it actually doesn't do anything, but in sign-up flows, it does. What we saw is we take uh, about a 10% hit on conversions into the onboarding and into the free trial uh, for every extra field that we added. So then we had a very honest conversation with the sales team you know, how many of these fields are you guys actually using? Because we should get rid of them if we're not using it. After that, after the initial sign up, the only way you're gonna get some really solid wins is with deep customer development. So really in-depth surveys, lots of time with customers, lots of user testing and user recordings through the funnel to see, you know, what pieces do they actually get value out of, and then how can you deliver that value instantly? So I try to stay, especially in onboarding, I try to stay away from you know, hacky conversion type stuff. And I'm always asking, what is the core value I need to deliver? And how can I make that happen sooner? Over here on your left. Do you have any experiences working with uh, companies that have experimented with, with, with setup fees versus ARR, or excuse me, with, versus going on annual plans and how that's affected um, their LTV or churn rate. Yeah. yeah especially for like service businesses mm -hmm. where you, you kind of have like a productized service on the front yeah, end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should definitely, if you can charge it, do it. Uh, so it's not gonna, it's not gonna save you from all these other problems, you know, getting all these other engines working together, the low churn, the expansion revenue, all that stuff, the acquisition. Uh, but if you add a you know, service fee for onboarding or setup, especially in any mid-market tier, it's very, very standard. And at enterprise, people expect it. They get worried if you don't have it. 
because uh, then they, it's kind of a sign that you don't know what you're doing. So it is a standard for larger customers. You should definitely be doing it, especially if you have, if you have a serious like, customer success team with very structured onboarding programs. Uh, you absolutely should be charging for that. Right? Any sales team is going to be able to add that to the contract without a major issue, if they're any good. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering, uh, you listed up there the uh, MRR, I'm over here, yeah. sorry. Awesome. I'm going back and forth. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, you listed the, the acceptable kind of MRR churn rates for, uh, for SaaS products. What, uh, would you expect those like minimum thresholds to be, to hold for annual, for the ARR? Like, uh, I mean, do you want to have, I mean, 3% or two, two to three percent annual as well, or are those a little bit higher for annual? No, annual is going to be a lot higher. So you basically have to take your monthly churn and then blend that all together, and that gives you an annual churn rate. Um, there's a bunch of equations. If you just Google like you know, turn monthly churn into annual churn, you'll get some equations, right? Okay. So it's compounding. What so about not... uh, annual to monthly? I guess. Yeah, same way. Goes same both way. ways. Okay. So the same benchmarks work at each one. Um, you just make sure you're using the right formula to calculate it. Okay. Thanks. Would you ever combine a freemium with free trial for a B2B downloadable product? Or do you think the free tier would be cannibalizing sales? I would do one or the other. Yeah. So when you do free trial versus a freemium, it's, it's one of those variables that you can't really build in isolation. You have to build the entire funnel around it. Everything from the acquisition before that to get them into the plan, and then how do you upsell them afterwards. You're gonna have an entirely different system, an entire maybe even an entire different org chart to support those separate funnels. So I would pick one. Um, if you can make freemium work, great. If you have the funds to support it, it's a great moat to build for your business. Uh, but if you can't, if you need to be leaner, you need to be much more careful with cash, then do a 14-day trial and just stick with that. Right here in the center. Can you talk a little bit more about the use cases where pricing per seat makes sense versus um, like a group of seats, the example that you used with join.me? Yeah, so when I'm considering whether or not a seat pricing metric is doable, really only need to ask one question. And that's if, are your users gonna be able to share a login? <laughs> and if they can, they will, okay? So like, you know, adding seats to like KISS metrics would be a horrible idea. Because right? people just share the same login and they'll all, you know, it's, it's just analytics. There's nothing personalized. Um, there's, there's very few pieces of the product that actually adapts based on who's logging in. So it would never work. Same thing with like survey tools or other data tools. People can just share a login. And you're gonna spend a lot of time trying to add a lot of authentication and security and to prevent that from happening, which then you're just fighting your users, right? Which is, um, you know, you're, you're, there's a huge opportunity you'd be missing out on that expansion engine. So for a seat metric to work, a core piece of your product, if not the majority of your product, needs to deeply depend on your users to be able to log in under unique accounts. CRMs, project management tools, um, any type of like, feed, like tool that depends on deep feedback, uh, like Google Apps, like everyone needs their own unique Gmail account. Any communication tool, Slack, another really easy example, right? Their pricing metric is almost too easy because everyone needs their own Slack account, right? It's a no-brainer. For a lot of other products, it's not a no-brainer. And that seat metric can actually be deceiving because it seems like it'll work really well, but for most products, it won't. Hey Lars, over here. Um, I don't have a SaaS application. I have a monthly recurring membership site where the primary draw is a course that a user gets to take. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if this framework is still applicable, and if so, how you would handle cohort expansion. Yeah, so if I had a course, I would not sell it on a subscription. That's, that's my, I'd sell it, I'd ramp up the price and sell it all up front. Um, that's because user decay rates in online courses are just very severe, right? So the churn rates are always going to be super, super high. And if you talk to, you know, a lot of, if you look at, like, any of the hardcore info product marketers, they've all done a membership site at one point or the other, and it generally stalls, right? It's very hard to make it work. 
So I have an, um, a SaaS product for unsophisticated SMBs. Um, by definition, they're kind of limited in the amount of value that will grow and still fit as a product because they're eventually they won't be an SMB. They'll probably grow themselves out of the product. Um, do you find that having like a dual access pricing um, hurts more than it helps when it comes to unsophisticated customers? So having multiple axes around your pricing, you, you'll need to have that at some point. Uh, the pricing metric is not the only way to set up your pricing. Like Patrick got into a lot of that yesterday. Right? So you're going to have tiers. You might have multiple products. You'll have various upsells. As you grow, you will need to add additional complexity. If you look at MailChimp, for instance, like they now have multiple products right, that you can also sign up for. You know, their advanced email tool, I don't even remember what it's called. Uh, they keep trying to sell me on it. And uh, you know, they have their, their normal, they have MailChimp, they have Mandrill, they have all this stuff, uh, multiple tiers within each. Uh, but that, that does not happen overnight. Right? So you'll definitely get there. And if you get big enough, you know, it, it is a great lever for expanding uh, your monthly recurring revenue over time. But you're essentially trying to take all those different tiers and all those different metrics and really isolate the value that each specific segment of your target market is trying to get and then capturing as much of that value as possible. Uh, so you'll, get, you'll need to, whether you, not, you want to, right? if you get big enough.